Okay, so good morning, everybody. Glad to have you here. And let's just take a couple of minutes to um, fully settle. Just simply kind of gathering ourselves, if you will. We can breathe together. And spend a moment really congratulating yourself on carving out this time for yourself. This is a nice gift you're giving to yourself and to the rest of us. We so can let go of the busyness from the earlier part of the day. And bracket this time as our special time together. So this week, the Torah portion that we'll be discussing is Korach. Briefly, this is a story of rebellion. Korach leads a rebellion focusing on um, Moses' leadership and Aaron's religious authority. And the story is really complex and there, and it involves a whole bunch of other players and lots of twists and turns but I am going to be focusing on these two primary characters, Moses and Korach, and what I think they represent. So I'm struck by the notion of Korach representing unbridled ego and rebellion for the sake of satisfying his ego and just wanting to grab power. Moses seems to be representing kind of a more mature, thoughtful, if you will, mindful approach. And just as a reminder, um, some of you know this, that Moses is traditionally associated with the Midah of humility. So as I was looking at these two characters and reading the Parsha, I really was seeing Korach as representing Yetzer Hara and Moses as representing Yetzer HaTov. So I'm gonna digress a little bit and explain these two qualities. They're both absolutely necessary, even though Yetzer Hara is often interpreted as the evil inclination. It's not. It is absolutely not something that I would consider evil. We all have this um, sense of impulsivity or passion or creativity and ego, and that's Yetzirah Hara. Yetzirah Hara is important. We wouldn't accomplish anything if we didn't have some ego investment, right? Or some passion. So it's that's important to recognize. Korach's energy was kind of volatile and certainly very passionate. He may have been really impatient, certainly ambitious and greedy. Maybe he was jealous and he may have been frightened. And all of that was in, in the stew for him, if you will. But sometimes this Korach energy is necessary because sometimes it's what we need in order to speak truth to power. So I just wanna underscore that. The Yetzer HaTov, on the other hand, 
is a much more measured response in any situation. Yetzer Hatov is associated with humility and wisdom. Yetzer Hatov is sort of outward oriented. It's care about the community, care about the other. There's a compassionate quality to Yetzer Hatov. So there's that real juxtaposition with that ego-driven Yetzer Hara. So my belief is that we all have both of these in us. So we all have a bit of Korach and a bit of Moses, a bit of Yetzer Hara, a bit of Yetzer Hatov. Um, so I think of these as sitting on my shoulders. I've given up Jiminy Cricket. It's Korach and Moses. So now back to the Parsha. Korach and his band absolutely overestimate their power and influence. They're very arrogant and they can't imagine that their challenge to Moses will incite God to do what Moses describes as bring about something unheard of. And in chapter 16, verses 31 and 32, we learn, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households, all Korach's people and their possessions. Pretty stunning. So in 2008, and I just want you to file that away, 2008, Rachel Cowan, who was one of my um, teachers, wrote a commentary on this Parsha. And this commentary was, is absolutely stunning. And I am going to read excerpts from it. A cabal of influential rebels tries to take power from Moses, daring to risk their lives to promote their own self-interest over the sacred destiny of their people. Their downfall is stark and dreadful. Yet the Torah teaches that even though Korach dies, his descendants live on. That happens in chapter 26, which is not in this Parsha. We certainly see them today. Cynical, political, religious, and communal leaders cloaking self-interest in the language of democracy, nationalism, or God. In wielding power in such short-sighted ways, these modern-day rebels represent an even greater threat to God's creation than Korach did to Moses' leadership. This Torah portion urges us to be vigilant, lest we lest such persons undermine the communities that we are called to create and sustain. But it is not only public leaders who play Korok's role today. We too live with an ongoing conflict between an inner Moses and an inner Korach, between humility and arrogance, between selflessness and selfishness, and until we can hear the difference between these two voices, our actions will not be effective in countering the power of the Koraks at large in the world. We need to be clear when it is the voice of our needy, small-minded self that advises us to act, or when it is the wise voice that speaks from our deepest and best values and truths. We need a practice of reflection to discern which voice is guiding us. Reading the Parsha, I ask, how do I recognize Korach in my own thoughts and actions? How do I liberate the consciousness that Moses had? In my job as the director of a wonderful nonprofit institute, I find that Korak seems to pop up most frequently when I am afraid. What if I don't succeed in raising enough money? What if I don't succeed at making our work known? What if I'm not good enough? What if this work fails because of my incompetence? In such moments of doubt, 
I make myself the central actor on stage, starring in the tragedy of Rachel. In that place of fear, I separate myself from the community doing the work and I clutch for some way to feel in control. I can't see the whole. There is no way to make wise decisions. But if I make time to breathe and reflect, I can hear the I shouting out in all its grandiosity. In that space, Moses can emerge and call me back to humility, to the recognition that I, like everybody else, am but a bit player on this stage. I can rekindle the trust that I have in the wisdom of the unfolding of the work and in the wisdom of my colleagues to figure out what will flow from this moment. Moses's path and ours is to move from the narrow place of doubt, fear, anger, and jealousy to an expansive covenanted life in a community of mutual care and responsibility. So just to reread one line, um, if I could find it. We need to be clear when it is the voice of our needy, small-minded self that advises us to act, or when it is the wise voice that speaks from our deepest and best values and truth. And I'd like that to be our focus as we sit in meditation today. Can you repeat that, Fran? Happily. We need to be clear when it is the voice of our needy, small-minded self that advises us to act, or when it is the wise voice that speaks from our deepest and best values and truth. So as we sit into meditation today, I invite you to reacquaint yourself with your inner Korach. I think that it's really important to get in touch with that part of ourselves because the, more, the, the better we know it, the more able we really are to discern when Korach or Moses is driving us and our decisions. So let's check our posture. And I want to remind you that your um, head should be reaching up towards the ceiling and maybe tuck that chin just a little bit so that the back of your neck is really in line with your spine. And there's no strain on your neck. And we'll take a couple of nice deep cleansing breaths. Breathing in as fully as you are able. Holding that breath for a moment. And then exhaling slowly and fully through your mouth. Inhaling. Holding. And exhaling. And once more at your own pace.
So I invite you to begin to deepen your breath and begin to bring your attention outward. And as you are slowly and gently coming back to the room, going to share a poem from Jennifer Payne Wellwood, Unconditional. Willing to experience aloneness, I discover connection everywhere. Turning to face my fear, I meet the warrior who lives within. Opening to my loss, I gain the embrace of the universe. Surrendering into emptiness, I find fullness without end. Each condition I flee from pursues me. Each condition I welcome transforms me and becomes itself transformed into its radiant jewel-like essence. I bow to the one who has made it so, who has crafted this master game. To play it is purest delight. To honor its form, true devotion. So, as you are ready, I invite you to unmute and share observations, insights, questions, concerns, anything. And I will turn off the recording. <laughs>